Bibles to Matthew 27. We are um, we're going to wrap up Matthew today. I'm so excited. It's um, you know I've taught many books of the Bible, but finishing this year or this sweep has just been so much. It's it's so exciting for me because you know this has been you know our new church and. We've, you know, gone through this entire gospel, and I've loved it. I, don't, I hope you have loved it. I hope I haven't bored too many of you. But, but I've loved going through the gospel again, and once again, just looking at, at the person and the ministry and the mission of Jesus. Reminded again what it says in chapter 1, verse 21, when the angel came to Joseph, and he said, this of the child that was going to be born, it says, he will save his people from their sins. That's been the, the theme for me personally. You know, there's a lot of different themes in Matthew's gospel. Matthew, the, test, the testimony of the tax man, the man who was redeemed by this very same Jesus. He recorded that particular line for us. This is the mission of Christ, that he came to redeem. And... Certainly for us who belong to him, we feel that, we recognize that. Today we are going to look at the, uh, his, you know, the finality of his death and then his resurrection, and then we'll finish with this, the instructions of the Great Commission. We begin in chapter 27, verse 55. We ended last week with... Um, the, the centurion, having made this great claim, truly this was the Son of God. He had witnessed the suffering. Of course, he was involved in the suffering, the beating of Jesus. But then when he saw how he died, how he yielded himself up, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. It's beautiful. He, he saw who Jesus was. So beginning in verse 55, it says, Many women were there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee while ministering to him. Among them was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it came evening, there was a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. There was a lot of Marys. Have you noticed? We, we have a lot of Johns. How many Johns? If, you're, if your name is John, raise your hand. Look, look around. We got a lot of Johns. <laughs> They had a lot of Marys. Mary was a very common name. Like John is a very common name. Jesus actually was the most common name. But these women, they're, it's so beautiful because it talks about how they were ministering. They were caring for ministering to Jesus. I love that. It's beautiful. They had a very, very prominent role. Ladies, I, don't, I hope every woman here feels special. It was kind of like the gals. They had to leave, by the way. <laughs> they, they came to give their little report, and then they had to take off because they work. But um, I think it's very important. I'm the father of four girls and, and a married man, and, and I recognize it's so important for women to, to feel special and to be involved in the church. Jesus changed everything for women. It, contrary to what some people believe, it wasn't the women's liberation movement. It was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This was in a time, culturally, when women were considered like animals. They were property. And, and Jesus, he changed all that. He elevated the status of women. I love that. And, and they, you know, who wouldn't respond to that? The women responded to him because he treated them differently. Christian men, you should treat women differently. You know, women are so mistreated, even to this day, even though, you know, there is so much more liberation and, and equal rights and things like that. Christian men, we ought to cr treat Christian women like princesses 
and queens because that's what they are before the Lord. And so the women, they were so involved and then also these certain men were involved in the care of Jesus' body after his death. Matthew tells us that Joseph, this Joseph of Arimathea, he provided the tomb. John tells us in John 19, he tells us that Nicodemus, if you remember Nicodemus, who was a member of the council, both of these guys were a member of the, the, the Jewish ruling council, um, but they were kind of like secret believers. Nicodemus, it says, came to him at night. In John chapter 3, we have that whole discussion of being born again. Nicodemus had questions for Jesus, and that's such a beautiful exchange. John 19 tells us that Nicodemus supplied about 65 pounds of uh, uh, anointing for Jesus' body. And this was the ex you know, expensive stuff, these oils with, with uh, frankincense and myrrh. And this is what they would do. They would take the body and they would wrap it in, in linens and in strips, and they would have this really strong aromatic oil to kind of, you know, counteract the decay, the smell of the decay, certainly. And so um, Joseph is there. He's, um, it tells us in John 19, 38, that he was a secret disciple. He, he, um, it says that he had some fear about coming forward. Of course, if you were a member of the Sanhedrin, you'd be afraid too, maybe. I think it's, it's, when you think about a secret disciple, I think about what a tragic opportunity these guys may have missed. They were able to hear and probably emboldened after Christ's death. He hadn't, you know, been raised yet, but they missed opportunity to take a stand for Christ while he was alive. I think what a kind of it's it's good that they stepped forward and ministered to him in his death. But man, it'd be so much better to take a stand for him while he was alive. You know, we you know, God and his sovereignty, he knew how this whole thing was going to play out. But it would have been so cool if we would read and the you know, the the council was together conspiring to put him to death. And Joseph and Nicodemus said, no way, you know, and a riot ensued or something like that, you know, where we would love that they would be our heroes. Amen? They would be our heroes. If they would have been, you know, had some spine and just said, no, I'm going to take a stand for this guy. But they didn't. And so, you know, they had to live with that. All I would just say about that is, you know what? You have so much time in your life to take a stand for Christ. You have so much time to honor him. It's time now. It's time today. Don't wait. So often, people, you know, they're, they're considering coming to Christ. They're considering being a Christian or taking a stand for Jesus. But it's something they put off, especially young people. And I don't really know what goes through their brains. I know what went through my brain when I was a young person. Not good things. But a lot of times, I think, especially for young people, they're thinking, well, I want to I goof off a little bit. YOLO, you know? I, I want to. I worked that in. Abigail would be so proud of me. You know. You only live once, right? And, and, and Jake's back there just shaking his head. I can't believe he did that. <laughs> LOL. Um, you, there, there's that attitude. It's like, oh, you know, I'm young. I just want to live it up. And if, if you're considering following Jesus, and if you have this attitude that somehow when you come to Jesus, you're not going to live it up, that is just wrong. I was, you know, just think about the two girls that were just standing here. I don't know even how, how old are they? Where's 21? They just got back from the Himalayas. I mean, for some people, that's like the trip of a lifetime. They would dream of going to the Himalayas. And they went to the Himalayas to proclaim the gospel of the risen Lord. Talk about you only live once. That is a life well lived a young life, given over to Jesus. And, you know, when you love the Lord and follow the Lord, you actually do get life because he said he came to give us life. So, you know, we can't say too much about that. Uh, you know, it's really cool that these guys had a part. 
they were emboldened after his death and they came forward and Joseph went to Pilate and said, I want to get his body. A, a lot of times afterwards for criminals, their bodies would be mistreated and, and, and it, it's, it's interesting. The Lord God the Father, he made sure that Jesus' body was completely preserved. If you remember on the cross, not a bone was broken, though normally they would break the bones of those who were dying. They didn't break a bone because the scripture says that not a bone would be broken. And his body was cared for and, and taken care of. And, and, and Joseph probably didn't really realize that he was fulfilling prophecy. But as he went and asked for the body, he was fulfilling Isaiah 53, 9, which says his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. He had a, he had a, a, a hewn out grave, which was, you know, not everyone had those things. They're kind of like the Cadillac of, of uh, you know, places to, to, to have when you die. And so he had that and he had it and he had it. The whole purpose why he had it was as a gift. Some speculate that it wouldn't have been for himself. I don't really know about that. I don't really care. It was just his. He had it and he had it to give. And so what a great honor it would be to be able to give to the Lord in that way. It says that there was a large stone. Uh, Mark 16, 4 tells us there was that the, the stone that they rolled in front of the tomb was extremely large. And so there's the tomb and, you know, the women are there ministering. They're, they're following the whole procedure. Joseph is there. Nicodemus is there with the anointing oils, and they've cared for the body of Jesus Christ, and then, of course, laid him in the tomb. It'd be so, such a heartache. It's a heartache to, to bury somebody, somebody who you love, and they were there caring for him and loving him. It says now, verse 62, on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate. And they said, sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I'm to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his, his disciples might come and steal him away and say to the people, he's risen from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go make it as secure as you know how. And they went and they made the grave secure along with a guard. They set a seal on the stone. So you've got this tomb. It was hewn out in the rock. They've got a large stone. We've, you know, I've seen some of these things in Israel. You, when you're there, you get to see these things and they're really cool. And some of the stones are just like huge. And they'll have a channel that they, they kind of roll in. And, you know, it was probably a two or three man job to roll this stone in place. But the Pharisees, they were like totally paranoid. We remember, it's interesting that they bring this up. We remember when he was alive, he said he was going to be raised on the third day. If you go back and remember, recall the testimony they were drumming up against him. The testimony that they were drumming up against him was the misinterpretation of that because they said, oh, he said he was going to destroy the temple and then rebuild it in three days. So he said this one thing. He said, if you destroy this temple, I'm going to raise it up in three days. And then the gospel writer tells us he was talking about the temple of his body. And so that was obviously understood. So when the guys came with this false testimony, they knew it was false testimony. That's not what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about their glorious building. He was talking about the temple of his body, the soma, the physical body that he was in. He says, you destroy this, which is, you know, prophetic because they were already planning it. He says, you destroy this, I'm going to be raised in three days. And this is weighing on these guys' brains. They're thinking, okay, we got rid of this guy finally. Our competition is dead. Hmm, but we're not really sure. Why aren't they sure? So many guys have analyzed this whole story from a legal standpoint, like a, a courtroom kind of a standpoint. Why weren't they sure? The reason why they weren't sure is because they knew who he was. That's my, I put that forward as my theory. They knew who he was because they, they saw the miracles. 
If you recall, when we went through the miracles, when the Pharisees accused him, they never once said the miracles didn't happen. They only ascribed them to the devil. They knew that Jesus was capable of the miraculous. And it's interesting that they were thinking about this. The disciples weren't. You would like to think that the disciples were the ones thinking, he said he was going to be raised from the dead. This is going to be great. You know, we would be there just being so excited with the faith that we have now. But they didn't see it. They didn't understand it. And the things that Jesus said to them, you know, he said, you're going to understand it later. He planted these seeds of truth. And, and anyway, these guys, they, they come and they say, hey, we got we to gotta do something about this. And Pilate says, you've got, you've got your own guard. You've got Roman soldiers dispatched for you guys. You just go and make it as secure as you know how. I like the King James, the King James language. It says, make it as secure as you can. Which is just kind of interesting to ponder, isn't it? How secure can you make it? You've got the Son of God who's declared, I'm going to rise from the dead. They've, they've been effective at killing him. But now they've got this grave and they've got the stone in front of it and that's not enough. They have this fear that somehow the disciples are going to come and snatch his body away, or, you know, make up a story or whatever. He says, you go and make it as secure as you possibly can. The truth is these guys were fighting against God. And they may have had an inkling of it. I like in Acts, there's this discussion. One of the Pharisees, I think Peter is preaching and they're trying to figure out what to do with these, you know, with this young movement of, of, of Christians uh, that are believing in Jesus. And, and there's this guy, uh, Gamaliel, and he pipes up and he says in Acts chapter 5, verse 39, he, he says, as they're trying to figure out what to do with these Christians, he says, if it's of God... That is the movement and the faith. He says, you will not be able to overthrow them or else you may even be found fighting against God. Which is exactly where these guys are right now. Go make it as secure as you can. Whatever. You can't make it secure. There's nothing you can do to keep him in that grave. So. They're doing what they can. They've got a seal. They've got a guard. Um, when we're thinking about the, the Roman soldiers. Uh, I like to, to remember and to just kind of have it in our brains. These are men who are trained for war. They, they are not um, electronic specialists in the military. Not that I'm not, I'm not discounting electronic mil, you know, specialists in the military, but these are battle-hardened guys who've seen battle. They have weapons and armament and... They're disciplined. They're tough guys. So this thing is secure. And, you know, there's a seal on the whole thing, and it comes with, you know, the, with Pilate's authority. And so they did. They made it as secure as they possibly could. Now, uh, verse 62, on the next day, oh, we already covered that, sorry. Um, verse 1 of chapter 28. See you guys. Youth sports. Have fun, Jake. <laughs> Chapter 28. Now, after the Sabbath, it began to dawn towards the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. We know um, from, I think it's Mark's gospel, that she actually came to put more spices on Jesus' body. She may have, you know, like a good woman, she probably thought Nicodemus didn't do the best job or whatever. She brought more. <laughs> she brought more and, and um, says, behold, it says, verse 2, a severe earthquake had occurred for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and he and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he, is, he was laying. Go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. 
There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, and they ran to report to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Ah, what a scene. There's this earthquake. I was going to add massive. There's a massive, massive earthquake. There was an earthquake when he died. There was an earthquake when he was risen. We don't know exactly how things happened behind the stone, you know. It's one of those things. It's like, ah, oh, why weren't there cameras, you know? We just want to see the whole thing. How did it happen and what did it look like? We know the other gospel writers give us lots of details. All the clothing was folded up nicely. Jesus was tidy. Maybe the angels did it. We don't really know. But, but there was this earthquake. Why was there an earthquake? It was like, just like the most monumental thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. An earthquake is good for an effect. God's just saying, this is a big deal. For everyone who was there in the region, I was like, what happened this morning? Man, there was an earthquake. You know, these days, I, I got an app that tells me when there's an earthquake anywhere around the world. This was just for them, for the people that were there. They, there was this violent earthquake. And then there was, we, we just see that there was an angel there. As they, as they approached, the, the ladies, as they came to, to care for Jesus' body, there was this earthquake that had occurred, and it says the, the angel of the Lord rolled the stone away. It wasn't the earthquake that rolled the stone away. The angel did this. And then I just love the scene. I, I, the angel's just sitting on top of the stone. Just chilling. I don't know. It's just like the weirdest thing. It's like, why isn't the angel just like, you know, you know I don't know, just doing something, but he's just... I don't know, maybe he's whistling or something, just hanging out. And it's such a beautiful picture. The angel is just chilling on the stone, and the guards are shaking. They're so afraid, they're like dead men. Have you ever shaken? Have you ever been so afraid that you just were shaking violently? I remember, it's really only happened to me one time, and I just remember... Um, I was afraid to go to jail. I was driving my car and I was in trouble. I knew I was in trouble. I wasn't running from the law, but I was in a little bit of trouble back in the day. And, and I just remember there was a police officer behind me and I knew that if I got pulled over, which had become pretty frequent, I knew that if I got pulled over, I was going to jail. And I just remember my legs were just like out of control just doing this. I was so scared. Here's, these are the soldiers. These are, this is the Roman guard that's there to protect the integrity of this tomb, to keep Jesus in. And he's out. He's out, and the angel's just there, you know, just taking it all in. Hey, guys, are you scared? I, it's hard not to look at this through our human lens and just kind of go, how cool is that? The angel's just going, hmm. You're shaking now, aren't you? You know, maybe these were the guys that were involved in his beating. We don't know all those details, but they're, they're afraid like, like dead men. There's such great things here in the two responses. They're afraid, the women are, they're, they have fear, but they're rejoicing. The idea, though, of the people who reject Christ the guards being guys who, you know, whether or not they individually came to Christ or not, we don't know, but they were there as part of the rejection of Christ. This is what happens when men reject Christ. They have a lot to be afraid of. We read about people, kings and rulers in Revelation chapter 6. During the tribulation time when all the crazy things are going on on earth, it says in Revelation 6, 15 and 17 through 17, it says, The kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man, they hid themselves in caves and among rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? 
That's the, that's the natural reaction of people who haven't put faith in Christ. And it's so different, isn't it? It's so different than our reaction. We're looking for that day. We're praying for that day. We can't wait for that day. When Jesus comes and makes all things right. The women, when they showed up at this scene, though they were definitely, you know, it got their attention. There was some fear. Yet it says that they, they had great joy. Verse 8. They left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and they ran to report to their disciples what they'd seen. For us, this is the most joyous occasion. The return of the Lord certainly is going to be a joyous occasion. We see them in really, when they see Jesus on the way, it says, they came and they took, uh, they, behold Jesus, verse 9, he met them and he greeted them. And they came and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. There is, just put this in your brain, this is the only response. It's not going to be, oh, there he is. Oh, here's my list of questions. When we get to heaven, are we going to have wings? Are there horses going to be in, are, I like my horses, horses going to be in heaven? You know, people speculate about all the things that they want to ask Jesus and know about and stuff. No, this is what you're going to do. When you encounter the risen Savior, this is really the only appropriate thing to do. You just fall at his feet and worship him. Because he's worthy of worship. It says, verse 11, While they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city, and they reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. And they said, you're to say to his disciples, uh, you were to say his disciples came by night and stole them away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. If you've ever read anything uh, again about the kind of just the legal arguments for this whole thing and the individual testimonies and and all of this the idea that somehow the disciples came and stole the body of Jesus it's just so foolish it's just such a foolish argument again Pilate gave these guys instructions go make the tomb as secure as you possibly can there's a detachment, probably four or six soldiers who were there to guard it. And then, what do they go and tell the Pharisees? It says that they went and reported to them everything that they'd seen. I don't think they went and said, dude, we went to, we fell asleep. Do you know what the punishment is in the Roman army for falling asleep while you're on duty? It's death. The Romans had this thing. They would they had the na- they had names for their diff- different punishments. This particular thing was called fustarium. And and w- whether it was falling asleep on the job or uh, falsifying evidence and lying under oath, which they're going to falsify evidence, I guess they're going to perjure themselves and tell a big yarn. But this fustarium, what they would do is they would pick out some of the soldiers and in the company of all of the soldiers, they would beat them with clubs or stone them with rocks. That's just the reality. That's how they treat, they were this pretty disciplined group. We're not, we're not going to put up with that. And so as they went to the Pharisees, they told them the truth of what happened. Right? They would have had to have. They're definitely not going to show up and say, oh, we fell asleep, sorry. They would have just said, what, you idiots? You're getting killed. No, they went to him with the truth. And what did the Pharisees do? Oh, oh, quick, let's make something up. Yeah, you just say that they came and stole him by night. How humiliating is that if you're a soldier? You know, to, to have to tell that story. Well, these women came and... You know, and, and, and a tax gatherer and a couple fishermen, 
you know, and they overpowered us or we were sleeping or whatever. It's just like, you know, no one would want to tell that story. Ah, uh, but for a little bit of money, people are so easily bought off. For a little bit of money, okay, we'll tell a story. You just, you just have to process that, how that probably worked in their hearts and in their minds over the years because they knew what happened. I don't know how any of them could have not eventually come to faith in Christ because they saw the whole thing. They knew what happened. They saw the religious hypocrisy and they knew that the story that they told was a lie. I just want to summarize. I think there's a beautiful picture here in the summary of the two responses to Jesus. The women and Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they have the loving response to Christ in all of this. The women followed him. It says in 2755, the women ministered to him, it says in 2755. Joseph and Nicodemus cared for his body. They provided a proper burial place. They, the women attended his burial. They followed, they watched the whole thing. They came later to care for his body. The women obeyed the heavenly messenger. He said, go tell, your, tell the brethren and, and, and meet you in Galilee. They worshiped Jesus when they came upon him uh, there on the road. And certainly in 28, 9, and 10, they saw Jesus. That's, the, that's what it looks like to be a follower, to be a believer, isn't it? It's like ministering, following, ministering, caring, providing, attending, obeying, worshiping, seeing. It's a beautiful picture. But then on the other side, the lying response to Jesus. The Pharisees were paranoid we got to keep this guy in the grave. They were paranoid. Pilate was placating. Eh, whatever you guys got to do, I don't, you know. I washed my hands with the whole thing again. Just make it secure. The soldiers were shaking. The council was conspiring. The board bribing. The leaders are lying. The council is covering it up. The soldiers succumb to the bribe, and the false story is spread. They're paranoid, placating, shaking with fear, conspiring, bribing, lying covering up the truth, succumbing to bribes, spreading lies. It's such a stark contrast, isn't it? It's like you could just kind of present this to somebody. How do you want to live? Do you want to live like this, being a follower, doing these great things, or do you want to live like this, paranoid and guilty, the sin of unbelief? It's very stark contrast. So, Picking up in verse 16, they, you know, the story is going to be spread, and as it says, it was to this day. It says, but, verse 16, the 11 disciples proceeded. They proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up, and he spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's beautiful. There's many other things that happened. Jesus appeared to, you know, the guys on the road to Emmaus. There was different things that happened. Matthew gives us the highlights of the things uh, that he thinks are important. Of course, this is gloriously important. I love that the 11 disciples, they did what disciples are supposed to do. They did what they were told. What an act of faith that was. Just, it's like, okay, we saw him die. Now the women are coming saying, hey, you know, we know that Peter and John went as well. But, but, but it's like, they all went to Galilee. If he was dead, that would be so futile. Why are we doing this? Why are we following these instructions? He died. It's over. Right? And so just the obedience, it was an act of faith. Every obedient act is an act of faith. Amen? When you decide to follow the Lord and put into practice the things that he tells you, it's an act of faith. You're trusting him. And so they were trusting him as they went. And then I just love the whole story of how it says, when they saw him, they worshipped him. Again, what, else, what other response is there? It's the only response when you see the Lord Jesus. You just worship him. He's the only one who's worthy of worship. And then it says, some were doubtful. I don't, I don't know about you, but that, that is just like a nugget of grace in the middle of this whole thing. There were some 
consider disciples who were actually doubtful. It says in Mark, Mark's gospel in 1611, it says, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen, they refused to believe it. I don't know about you, but I, I'm a little bit of a skeptic. I think I would, I would be there. Like, are you kidding me? What have you been drinking? I watched him die. And, and, and they didn't really get, it, get, it, get the whole thing. Turn over to John chapter 20. There's the beautiful story of Thomas. One that we're all familiar with. We, you know, use the phrase doubting Thomas pretty liberally. And of anyone who, who doubts something. And I, I love that Jesus is never put off by questions or put off by just rational concerns or doubt. And, and I think it's important to, to remember this part of the story. It says in verse 24 of John 20, Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I get that. That that does not seem incredibly unreasonable for me. This isn't something that happens all the time. They hadn't seen this before. They watched him die. It's, It's reasonable. And it says, verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside with Thomas, and Thomas was with them, and Jesus, uh, he came, the doors having been shut, and he stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. He rolled on through the closed doors. That's one I'd like to see, too. You know, he, he, he just does the miraculous. This is what he does. He rolls through the, the, the closed doors and just says, hey, peace. I'm, I'm here. Relax. And he knows that Thomas is there. He knows that Thomas hasn't yet believed. And Jesus is so gracious to him. He said to Thomas, knowing what he had said, which is another, you know, a miracle in and of itself. He just says, hey, Tom, come here. <laughs> Check it out. He says, reach here with your finger. See my hands, reach here with your hand, put it into my side, and do not be un- unbelieving, but believe. Believing. Be believing, Thomas. Love that. It's God's grace. He's not put off by our questions, our valid questions, or, or you know, the things that we don't get. You know, I don't get it all. I don't understand everything. No one does. We believe by faith, but he did what Thomas needed to, to have, he did for him. He said, say, touch me. And then Thomas, I just love his response. Thomas, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Amen. Done. <laughs> Converted. He just declares, Jesus, you're God. And that's all it takes. And, and you know what? The Lord will do that for you. If you have questions, if you have things that you're not really sure about, the Lord's not put off by questions. I think he loves them if they're authentic, if they're real, honest questions. I got a, a, a an email from someone, someone who I love, this young gal who um, I've been a youth pastor to for years, and she wrote me one of these just like incredible letters of just, hey, I was thinking about you, and I just wanted to thank you for investing in my life. And she said, just one little paragraph I want to read for you. She said, Thinking back to one of my first memories of you, during Bible study, I asked a question about where believers went before Jesus came to earth, and you weren't sure. But you came back after study to talk with me and answer. It was the first time I ever felt important to a pastor. And, and I, I, I remember that, and, and sometimes during you know youth group and stuff, People, kids would just ask kind of like, that doesn't really have anything to do with anything kind of questions. And it was like, you know, uh, yeah, we'll get back to you later on that. But But I answered her question and she remembered it. And it was one of those things that for her, it was like monumentally important. I love that. And it's, that's what Jesus would do. You have questions? That's okay. Do you have some doubt? 
that's okay. He's not put off by it. For the intellectually honest questions, he's just not put off by them. He knows who we are. He knows who you are. And I love that for Thomas, he just wanted to ask or answer his, his concerns, and he cleared it all up. And his response to Thomas, it's so different than the response that he would have for the Pharisees, isn't it? In Romans chapter 1, Paul lays out God's attitude towards those who reject Christ. You know, again, there's a difference between having valid questions or concerns and those who just reject him. The Pharisees and that whole conspiracy would be the type of those who reject him. In Romans chapter 1, it says this, verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? Who suppress, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So for the people who just reject him because they don't want to believe in him, there's wrath coming. But it's very different than those who just have questions or concerns. For those that have questions or concerns, he's just totally gracious. And he says, you know, knock, seek, ask. And I would just say to you, if you have questions about the gospel, about Jesus, or about anything in the scriptures, I want to help you with that. The Lord's not put off by those questions. Finally, we end with this great commission. The, the authority that, he, that Jesus has, the authority for the great commission, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And you know what? That authority at this point has been pretty clearly proven, hasn't it? Over his life, he's, he's demonstrated who he was. The resurrection itself being kind of the final sign of authority, putting the stamp on everything that's happened. Without the resurrection, the cross loses its power. Without the resurrection, everything that Jesus said is, it just becomes kind of good, interesting philosophy, doesn't it? Paul said, turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. Paul made the great argument about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, he says now, verse 12, if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say you that there's no resurrection of the dead? So that argument was going on just as it is today. He said, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised, verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. In verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. That's pretty definitive, isn't it? If there was no resurrection, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, there is no general resurrection. No one's getting raised and you're just dead in your sins. And so the resurrection, it validates the work of the cross. It validates all of Jesus' work. And so, again, that, that work that he came to do, Matthew 1, 21, she's gonna bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, he's gonna save his people from his sins. It's verified by the empty tomb. And then, so we see the authority of Christ, and then the plan. The plan is just really simple, go. It's, it's for the believers, it's for the disciples, go. Go where? Go into all the nations. Go and do what? Make disciples. Baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to go make disciples. Verse 20 says, teaching them to observe, observe all that I commanded. And he says, lo, I'm with you. Romans 10, 14 and 15 says, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in whom whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Romans 10, 14 and 15. This is our job. This is your job. It's not just my job. You know that, right? The instructions were for all the disciples to go. 
And whether it's going to Nepal or going across the street or going to the next cubicle over, as believers, we're ambassadors of Christ. We carry the truth of the gospel. And our job, the instructions by our commander, is just really simple. Go. Go with this good news and share it. Tell it. The idea of, of the, the, the word of Jesus, it's, it's the story. I love how the gals talked about how they just told Jesus stories. You don't have to have, you know, you don't have to understand all Christian theology and doctrine and all that and, and get into debates. You just need to tell the story of Jesus. Tell it from your own perspective, what you've seen and experienced. Tell it from what the scripture says. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so that's our job is to do this, is to bring the gospel to the world. Next week, we begin Acts. In you know, one of the first lessons, it, it, you know, it's the whole outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the launching of the church for this very same work. As Jesus tells us to go, as he tells the disciples and sends them out, he gives them authority and he also gives power. You know, one of the things you're faced with, as soon as you, you consider, you know, sharing Christ, the girls talked about how the mountain was a barrier. There's so many barriers to sharing the gospel sometimes. And what do you need in order to overcome that? You need power. It says in Acts 1.8, it says, you're gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you're gonna be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even the remotest part of the earth. And so that's the promise and that's what we'll begin next week talking about. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the power that launched the early church. It's the same power that will help you and I as we go out and share this good news. Amen. Let's stand.